Hello, in this video, we're in the simple linear regression setting and we're going to look at the Bonfroni and the working hoteling adjustments. And so, briefly, if we're in the simple linear regression setting, it says that our data, Y, follows a line with some air. So the data fluctuate around this line. And since we're going to construct confidence intervals or hypothesis tests, we need the normal assumptions and that the air term follows a normal distribution with mean zero and constant variance um, sigma squared and they're independent from one another. Now the sort of the general take is is the more you more tests you conduct the more likely you to make errors and that error kind of compounds the more tests you do and so that's sort of the very basic idea of why we need adjustments so if we assume we want to conduct two confidence intervals, one on beta 0 and beta 1, both at the alpha level, or 1 minus percent alpha level, can we conclude, or can we be 1 minus percent alpha, that both the intervals are correct, meaning capture the true parameter? And the answer is no. And here's a, here's a, a quick little proof why. So let's let CI be the confidence interval for beta I. And of course, we only have two here, zero and one. Let AI be the event that the confidence interval CI captures beta I, meaning it correctly captures it. And we want to look at the probability that both our intervals capture the true parameter. And then this relationship is a well-known relationship. You know. You look at the probabilities of each and then minus the union. And so here we know that the probability of one of the confidence intervals that we conduct at the alpha level. So this probability that is correct is one minus alpha. The probability that this would be correct, meaning it captures the true alpha, is one minus alpha. And this is whatever it is. And this can be a tricky thing because we don't know the relationship between these two events. And so let's take a worst case scenario. So since probability, you know, we want it as, as large as possible, but the worst case scenario would be if this was one. So we put a one there and then we do the math. And so this probability can be as low as one minus two alpha. And as a quick example, if we conduct both the tests at the 95% level, or some like to say the 0.05 level, then the probability that both of our intervals are correct is you know at mo or you know at least 90%. So we can't guarantee that we make a type 1 error rate, you know, at the at the 95% le or the 0.05 level. And this is I mean this is a whole category called multiple comparisons. I've started a a playlist called multiple comparisons and right now there's only two videos it's proofs of the Bonfroni Holmes uh, adjustment and the Symes adjustment. And so as we go, I'll add more and more to that, but now there's only two. And so what the topic that we were discussing here is what's called the experiment-wise error rate. So it's the probability of making at least one type one error over all comparisons. Okay. And now the Bonfroni adjustment tries to maintain this type 1 error rate okay and so the idea is this we want to set the experiment wise error rate at some level say alpha prime and then we set and so that means we want this joint probability the probability that both intervals are correct to be 1 minus alpha prime and so we notice that it's you know it's at mo it's at least this right so and this is the worst case scenario. So if we set the worst case scenario whoop, here to what we want and then back solve for alpha and that says that alpha is alpha prime over 2 and that means we conduct each test or confidence interval at the 1 minus alpha prime over 2 level and then that guarantees that the probability that we make at least one type one error is maintained at the 0.05 level or whatever you pick the original um, 
air rate. And this is the Bonfroni approach and it generalizes extremely well to more than two events. Okay, And we'll talk more about that in later videos, but right now we're in the simple linear regression setting. So to construct confidence intervals for beta 0 and beta 1 such that the experiment wise error rate is alpha, we need to conduct each individual confidence interval at the alpha over 2 level. Okay, So if this this is the confidence interval for beta zero, but normally you know this piece right here would be alpha over two, but we replace the alpha with alpha over two, so then you have alpha over two over two, which is alpha over the fourth, and then so if you conduct these individual hypothesis tests at the alpha over four level, I mean at the alpha over two level, which means you know, you have to divide it by two when you're doing confidence intervals. So the, this is it. And then these two would main that type one error. And I really think a graphical illustration is going to be helpful. In the previous video, we um, that was PV15. Oh, there it is. We, we looked at a, a joint or a simultaneous confidence region for beta zero and beta one. And we, and we found this, right? So if this is the beta zero possibilities, this is beta one possibilities, we develop this. But in this video, if we conduct each test at the alpha level, we get these inner pieces, right? But if we Bonfroni adjust, it actually makes them go wider. And the same here with beta zero. If the Bonfroni adjusted, the individual adjusted, but if we look at the region that's cut out by the Bonfroni adjusted confidence intervals, it, it may look something like this. And so it, essentially it decreases the, you know, in here and it decreases in here. But, you know, there's some pieces that are outside the original region. Anyway, so this is a graphical illustration of what's going on. Now, the Bonfroni adjustment, I, I actually think is, is so powerful and so easy and it can be applied to anything, any test, any confidence interval, any prediction interval, etc. You think of it, it can be applied to it. And that's the beauty and the strength of the Bonfroni adjustment. It generalizes to more than two comparisons so easily. Here we had two comparisons, so we conducted each comparison at the alpha over two level. But if we had R comparisons, then we would conduct each one at the alpha over R you know, level. Um, but the downside is when the number of comparisons get large, that confidence interval gets so wide that it's really not even worth using. And so um, you have to think about it. So if it gets large, I, and I think 10 is probably too large, it starts to get too wide. Uh, definitely okay for, you know, three, four, five. And anywhere between five and 10 depends upon the situation. Um, I've done simulations, and this is, was a long, long time ago, so I'm going on memory. But it could, I found some cases that it's good for up to seven comparisons or six or, you know, somewhere around there. So it's large is in quotes. But now the next uh, adjustment, we're going to look at the hoteling, the working hoteling uh, confidence band. And so work, there are two statisticians in 19... Uh, 29 developed this confidence band for the simple linear regression case. Now I've seen some references say that it's that they developed it for the multiple linear regression case in this article, but that's not true. It's specifically for the simple linear regression. Now since then, of course, they've expanded it to the multiple linear regression. But the idea is this. So this is a reminder. If we want a, a, a confidence interval for the average y at a particular x, we of course we did this in previous video 14. It was this right here, okay? And as a graphical illustration, it would be this. So at, at this x, we, we found this confidence interval. Now some people create these bands, and those represent if you were to conduct a test at say this point, then the interval would be this. 
okay? But there's no attempt to adjust for multiplicity here. So this is good. It's protected at the alpha level for one point. That's it. And so, so if we're interested in several points, say we want x, x1 through xr, you know, so let's, we're in the average y for several points, r points. We should not conduct each one at the alpha level, okay? It's just not applicable. We, the type 1 error rate is, is so high, or the experiment-wise error rate is so high that it's, you're, you're not protected. So, but if we're only interested in two or three, a bond froni approach would be very applicable. And, and you could use it there. You just alpha, you did divide it by how many comparisons of interest. But really, if what if you're interested in the whole range of X? And so there's like, pick any X. Well, then bond froni adjustment is not gonna work, okay? So what working and hoteling proved um, using uh, envelope theory is this, that this difference, absolute value of this difference, has the probability of this absolute difference is less than this for any x you pick is 1 minus alpha. So no matter how many points you pick, the experiment rise error rate will always be maintained at the 1 minus alpha level or the alpha level. Okay, so the envelope theory, and we're only going to touch on it heuristically on the next page, but what it does, it and it's and this is really big if you're an economist. They love this envelope theory. It's quite useful. So you're trying to minimize or maximize a function with constraints that has additional parameters in it in the function you're minimizing or maximizing. And you want to see how that function varies based upon those other parameters in your function. And that's the theory that they use to develop this. And it's so ingenious how they did it. And so what I want to do is kind of give you a graphical illustration of what was going on. <laughs> now remember in the previous video 15, we developed a confidence region for the beta zero and beta one. We used a multivariate approach to do this. And that maintains the alpha level. So what they did using envelope theory is they developed these solid lines here, hyperbola actually. And what it essentially is doing is pick, when you pick a point then they, they used all these possible values, you know, and varied the and varied the lineup like this. And so the extremes, you know, ended up being, a, you know, a, a, an asymptote. A, a, and anyway, so what it does is it develops these hyperbola. And in the in the article, that's the they give the equation for these hyperbola. And it's really based upon this. This was the restriction that the betas be contained in this ellipsoid. Um, well, anyways, that's that's kind of a rough argument of what what they were doing. And then what that does is it protects the experiment wise alpha rate or the experiment wise error rate for as many X's as you want to pick, which is kind of crazy in itself. Um, so that's the power of the working hoteling adjustment. And so this is the confidence interval for the average Y for a given X. And this is for all X's that you want to pick, that that protects the experiment-wise error rate. Well, that's all I have for this video. Hopefully you enjoyed that. I sure did. Now the next video, we're going to start introducing residuals and why they're important and why we want to look at them when we're modeling our data. Yep, hope you enjoyed that. I sure did. Please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks, bye.